Addressing the mental health needs of Jacksonville's children in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. I, um, to my left, Vicki Wadowich, the director of Jacksonville System of Care Initiative, Partnership for Child Health. Denise Marzula, the president of the Mental Health Association of Northeast Florida. Gary Bevel, the children's ombudsman for um, System of Care, and Gwen Steverson the Chief Probation Officer of um, Florida Department of Juvenile Justice. And they're, they're going to share information with you and then they would like to take your questions at the end because they have, there should be some time. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Good. Well, I'm Denise Marzullo. I'm the Executive Director of Mental Health America of Northeast Florida. We are an awareness, advocacy, prevention, education um, organization focused on mental illness. So we do a lot of these type of events trying to get the awareness of mental illness out, um, educating the community on what mental illness is and what it isn't, um, trying to decrease the stigma with mental illness, and we also do a lot of advocacy. So we. Um, are really focused right now on this year's legislative session. There is a lot of momentum um, focused around mental health um, funding and legislative priorities, so um, we'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, so we're real excited to be here um, and happy that there's so many that stuck it out till 3.15 on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> I guess the rain has helped us because um, it was sunny. And I, uh, <laughs> um, so, so the four of us work, work together all the time, and so we were kind of excited to come and present to you um, collectively because um, I can tell you that one of Jacksonville's greatest strengths in the mental health community is the collaboration amongst all of the providers. So when I'm in Tallahassee, I hear all the time that there's a lot of silos when it comes to mental health, and that's just not the case in Jacksonville, and um, we should be really proud of that as a community. So. We all kind of work really hard together to try to address um, some of the barriers to mental illness, um, especially when it comes to our kids. Um, so we talk a lot about prevention, and you're not going to get any more preventative than providing prevention to kids. Um, we know that kids who are involved in the juvenile justice system have about a 40 to 60 percent higher chance of getting involved in the adult criminal justice system. And so we try to do everything we can to prevent um, and divert, um, especially for our kids that are struggling with a mental illness. Um, so I'm gonna start out just kind of talking about a case study. Um, I would love to say that this is a rare um, case study, but it's probably not. Um, so I know a young lady, and I will call her Veronica, and I know Veronica really well. She's actually even been to my house for Thanksgiving dinner. That's how well I know her. Um, she was born addicted to cocaine. Um, she has a twin brother who clearly was also born addicted to cocaine. Um, immediately taken away from her family um, and placed into the foster care system. Multiple, multiple foster care placements with and without her brother. Um, she very early on also showed um, signs of mental illness in the forms of depression and anxiety. At the age of 12, she was arrested for the first time because she was being a lookout for her um, twin brother and her older brother who were selling drugs. And that was her first involvement in the juvenile justice system. Um, when she got out, her grandmother asked to have custody of her. She went to live with her grandmother built a very significant bond with her grandmother, and then um, her grandmother kind of got to the point where she couldn't care for her anymore because she had her own needs. And so she was placed back into foster care um, at the age of 14. At that point, she went through eight foster care homes, 
until she finally transitioned out at the age of 18. And she, um, like many kids who have child welfare involvement and early juvenile justice involvement, she acted out a lot um, with anger. She had a lot of anger. Um, and she got a felony domestic violence charge against her for, um, I think it was with her brother. Um, that got on her record. And because she was 19, it wasn't ever erased from her record. She got a little bunch of different misdemeanor charges. And by the age of 21, she finally had, had decided enough is enough. Or by the age of 20. Um, she enrolled in University of North Florida. Um, and in 2013, got a degree in social services. Um, so she earned her bachelor's degree. And we would all love to say, yay, success. However, because she has such a significant record, she cannot pass a background screen at all. In fact, Vicki and I both have tried to hire her. <laughs> um, and she can't pass a background screen because we have a contract with the city. We can't hire her. Um, we have tried to get it waived and have talked with as high up as it gets with the Department of Children and Families and cannot get it waived. Um, so she is now a college graduate, but because she majored in social service, can't really get a job in social service, and she is working at Pizza Hut. Um, she is a, a remarkable young woman um, who probably, you've got to love her because she doesn't let anything kind of define her and she just keeps going. Um, her brother, however, is um, back in prison. He was out for about five months, and honestly, for Veronica's case, I'm kind of happy he's there because he's not a good influence on her. And um, he tries to kind of take over some of her things. So um, unfortunately, that is just one of the many um, youth turned adults that we have in Jacksonville that because of being born in the wrong circumstances um, has really kind of created a path for her that is really hard for her to come out of no matter how strong and how much she tries. Um, so we, we work real hard um, with people like her and other children who struggle with a mental illness who unfortunately um, aren't always born into the best circumstances. So with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Vicki who's gonna present some data. And Thank you. Um, you know, interestingly, when uh, Denise is talking about uh, Veronica, uh, because I, Veronica was also one of my students. I teach at the University of North Florida um, on a part-time basis, and she was one of my students. And after Veronica, I started asking my students when they were coming, the very first class, how many of you have had any kind of arrest or any kind of charges, because I teach juvenile delinquency. If you're getting a degree in social work or criminal justice, you might want to rethink that if you are majoring in this, because we are we did have, and we really try to um, work in a lot of different arenas in order to get that weight, and we could not. Um, so I'm Vicki Wadewich, and I oversee the Jacksonville system of care, and this is a $9 million federally funded initiative that's really um, seed money given to communities to help uh, address the mental health issues for um, high-risk populations. And in our community, the populations that we uh, focused on were not only juvenile justice or juvenile delinquency, uh, juvenile delinquency and child, children and child welfare, but also homeless and uh, subsidized child care. So um, subsidized child care aside, a lot of these children go in and out of systems. And uh, we, we, uh, Denise was just talking about her, um, Veronica. Uh, she's actually like the trifecta of systems. She's mental health, juvenile justice, and child welfare. Um, one of the things with these system of care grants is that we've been able to pull together, and fortunately, like Denise says, we do have a very collaborative community. Uh, the resources are few, as I'm sure has been talked about earlier, um, because we do have um, uh, scarcity of resources or they keep decreasing, it's, it's really catalyzed the community to have to be collaborative. Because if they're not, then, uh, then families and children fall through the cracks. And so with that, the system of care 
grant that was provided to our community has brought together the leadership of all these systems. Um, as a matter of fact, um, uh, the people here on my board earlier, you had the state attorney and the public defender there on our board of directors, the foster care system, the managing entity, and the ideal is really to come together and look at uh, what is some of the deficits, what are the, uh, the gaps in, in services, what are the barriers to accessing care, um, how do we screen and identify kids early um, so that we can implement um, interventions early? And then also youth participation is a really, um, not only cultural competency, but youth participation is a real uh, primary goal of these grants because we really do need youth to, to be part of the solution. And Gary's gonna talk about that later. But one of the things I wanted to do was really to kind of paint the landscape. And I know there's probably been a, been a lot of data shared, but We've been hearing for the last few years about how crime is decreasing. Crime is decreasing nationally, uh, juvenile crime is decreasing statewide, the, the Department of Juvenile Justice talks about that all the time, uh, crime is decreasing locally. And so um, our this is uh, from the Department of Juvenile Justice, we have uh, approximately you know, 78,000 children that were arrested last year. This is a, about a 27% reduction, kind of, it mirrors national. and. We also, and if you look at the local, our crime is decreasing too. And the reason I think it's so important to put these numbers out there is because when we hear that crime is decreasing, it's decreasing about 78,000 is a lot of children. And 4,000 is a lot of children. And so when we're talking about the percentage of children in these systems that have mental health issues, so we hear about them decreasing, but it's still a very significant number, and I think it's really important to kind of make sure we can tangibly see that. So where are these children at? Well, in the state, the department has, has we've got the prevention, detention, diversion, uh, <coughs> community supervision, and commitment. And so I know there's been discussion about commitment earlier. Please keep in mind this slide is not um, indicate the transfers to adult. So we do not have that number on here, so I know there's discussion about that earlier. But when we're, uh, and this number is really important, when we look at 28,000 kids in detention. Because one of the things that I think it's important to know, I know the previous preventer, uh, presenters talked about 70% of children and juvenile justice having mental health issues. I know um, SAMHSA, we like to talk, uh, SAMHSA likes to talk about uh, one in five children. One in five children um, having a mental health issue at some point in their life. In a classroom of 30, that's six children. Um, and then, if you, you know, the National Institute of Mental Health talks about 65% of boys and 75% of girls in juvenile detention having a mental health issue. Well, when we're looking at what we have, 28,000 in detention, and then in Florida here alone, or in Duval County. In Duval County, this is just a just from last year in our detention center, we ranged anywhere from 56 to 113 on any given day. Now, in January, we actually looked at that number a little closer, and we had 81 children or 71 children in the detention center. So we have up here, but when we looked at how many were identified with mental health issues, it was 16. And so one of the reasons that we actually have to go back to the national norm and what um, nationally it, the data look like, because of the fact that that is one of our challenges here in the state of Florida. And especially with the Department of Juvenile Justice, I know Gwen will talk about that later, is about really looking at what is the prevalence of uh, mental health issues in our, our um, state system, because we do not collect that at the aggregate level. Um, we don't collect it, it's collected at a program level, but it's very difficult to get that information. And I know Denise will talk later about some of the state and local initiatives, but one of the reasons that, um, and I will go on record as saying why that is so important, is because right now in Tallahassee we are fighting for funding, but the Department of Juvenile Justice um, is not, uh, because of the fact that we don't really have the prevalence identified so much. So. Um, uh, they, they are not requesting an increase in uh, funding for mental health. So, that's my story. And, uh-oh. Okay. 
And so, and then when we look at child welfare, 85% of children in the child welfare that are being sheltered have a mental health issue. And in our circuit alone last year, that was over 1,700 children that were removed. So when you're talking 65 to 75% in the juvenile justice system, when you're talking 85% of children in child welfare, when you're looking at the numbers, um, that's a lot of kids. And Denise is going to talk later about some, how this translates into behavior, but I know you've heard this already and why it's so important to identify. And some of the most common diagnosis, I know I came in to hear uh, from the previous presenters that maybe they're overdiagnosed and these aren't necessarily the, um, what their diagnosis would be, but these are the most common diagnosis uh, of children in the delinquency system. Um, I would suggest that it's probably the uh, unidentified trauma that contributes to these diagnoses. And that is one thing that um, we'll talk about later with our strengths, that we are getting better in our state and in our community of identifying trauma and looking at trauma. But I think it's important to paint this landscape on what the numbers of children actually look like. Because um, for those of you, which I believe there's a lot of you in here that are attorneys, if you have a caseload, if you're a public defender in the juvenile division, and I don't know what your caseload is, but let's just say it's 100, that's 70 kids that you can pretty much assume you're gonna have, have mental health issues. So maybe your case are a little higher than 100, I don't know. But um, just put it in context. Um, so I'm gonna actually now turn it over to Gary to talk, uh, to go a little bit deeper with kids, the subpopulations of kids that are in those systems. Thank you, Vicki. And uh, thank you all, thanks to Betsy, uh, to the law school, uh, and to each of you for joining us, especially on a Friday uh, at 3.15, your <laughs> true troopers. Uh, and I want to start by saying every professional I've ever had the pleasure of working with, I feel very comfortable saying they've always wanted to do the best thing they could to ensure that we were, you know, putting kids on a path to be their healthiest and happiest. Whether we've always agreed on how to go about that um, is what Primarily, I think I'll be talking about, but for the most part, you know, whether it's guardian ad litems, whether it's the defense attorneys for parents, whether it's uh, DCF attorneys, caseworkers, everyone wants the best interest of children. It's just how we go about that sometimes that isn't um, always lined up. And I, I would like to share a little bit about what brings me to this work particularly, because when I was in law school, there was just no way you could have told me that this is what I would have ended up doing. I quit after my first year, um, primarily probably because I took advantage of, I forget what it was called, we had like counseling services, so you could go get like nine free. And I did that, realized I was angry and depressed, got treated for depression and ADD, and realized I just needed some time to like hang out and do nothing for a while, so I did that for three semesters, came back, refused to look at any grades. I determined that if I failed, they would let me know, and if I didn't, <laughs> I'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, externed at the uh, district attorney's office in Wake County, and my first job was as a prosecutor in Miami. A couple things about that. Uh, there were some protective factors in there that I had that I think it's important to think about when we think about what children need. Uh, one, it was that even though I, I was, I'm a Jacksonville native, uh, but I left Jacksonville at 18 as a closeted young gay man, uh, and I was sure that this place could not keep me safe, would not protect me, and would not look out for me. Mm -hmm. So that was important. What saved me and what kept me from only thinking about suicide was having a mother who told me I was special all the time, who rewarded me and acknowledged and paid attention to where she was putting me in school, um, how I was behaving personally, uh, and things of this nature. And then I went to two of the best schools in the city, James Weldon Johnson for middle school, Stanton for high school. So I was surrounded by people who reinforced uh, the importance of education, the importance of health and well-being. So these were some protective factors that kept me from perhaps going down a different road. And so when I did do things that could have gotten me arrested, like many of the young people we're talking about now, like when I went, uh, I worked at the movie theater uh, when it was AMC Regency 8, you know, it's not the 24. But, um, you know, me and some of my friends we, who worked there, we were in one of their cars smoking marijuana in the car. None of us, 
even near or close to the age of 18, let alone the fact that it's illegal anyway. <laughs> right. But the types of neighborhoods we were driving in, the chances of us getting pulled over were lower. And if we had, because of who my friend's dad was, which I won't go into that, the chances of us having been arrested um, or not having our parents involved before we got too far down the juvenile process were very low. So again, there were all these protective factors that kept me um, and kept a lot of the young people I grew up with from encountering these very experiences. One thing uh, I should also thank you all for is I got to see uh, my buddy and colleague from <laughs> the Guardian Planning Program down in Miami, and we shared a supervisor who told us as soon as we began training that don't for a second think that folks uh, in the upper echelon, the haves, so to speak, uh, in Miami, she used the example of the folks in Coral Gables. Don't think for a second they're not having the same instances of abuse, abandonment, neglect, or juvenile delinquency. Just understand that there are nannies and money and schools and other things that protect them and keep them from ending up in front of our system. So I kind of needed to begin with that um, and talk about also that one of the reasons I think we have this the frustration that we've heard many of the presenters talk about today and that many of you might have experienced in your work and you may be learning about uh, and the lack of sort of coordinated services because we lack a coordinated framework I think for thinking about the needs of children and how to respond to them so one of the things I'm really excited that I get to work on is being the children's ombudsperson and using the United Nations Convention on the rights of the child and fulfilling those rights as a framework for approaching children's educational, emotional, physical, uh, leisure, uh, all of their needs, and understanding that these rights are indivisible, so you can't have one without the other. Uh, they're non-discrimination, doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, who your parents are, how you identify, um, and that the best interests of children be considered in all decision making. It doesn't mean we always make the decision that's in the best interest of children, but it means that every step of every decision-making process, we have considered the needs and the best interests of children. So that's why the United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, that framework, and then my goal, um, working with many of the folks we've talked about and many of the people in this room, actually, is to build a child-friendly city. And a child-friendly city gives us nine benchmarks for how a city can ensure that they're fulfilling the rights of its children um, in all of its processes and in everything it does. So, when we talk about marginalized populations and some of the things that prevent us from seeing the more positive outcomes uh, we would like to see, often we see that in the beginning of cases with managing information and sharing information and understanding what information can be shared, when, how, um, and with whom. So, one thing I like to have folks keep in mind is this, a lot of the information we share follows young people, so it's very important that we counsel and offer access to information to them about what that means. To the best of our abilities in an age-appropriate manner, do they understand their diagnosis? Do they understand what we're talking about when we're talking about mental health? Do they understand the importance of sharing or not sharing information? If they have a disability, if they have um, uh, if they're a part of a sexual minority, so they may identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or have uh, exhibited or been pointed out as having gender non-conforming behavior, do they understand what it means to share that and how that can be beneficial, uh, how that can be used against them? Uh, so have they been told what some of the advantages of letting their judge know that information might be versus what some of the consequences might be so they can help be a part of that informed decision-making process? Far and away, in working with young people, I've, I've never had a case where a young person who was involved and included in the process, even when they're told no, they're, they're usually fine and happy because they were heard and they were listened to and they felt like they got to be a part of the process. It's the young people who don't feel like that who then reject these case plans and these demands and resist restraints, uh, any kind of restraint on their liberty it, it's not shocking to me that they would do that when often they come from some long line of trauma um, and then they're then not included and not heard um, in these processes that are disrupting or continuing to disrupt their lives. So another thing for lawyers to remember in particular, I think, is uh, of course the rules of evidence are gonna be quite different if we're talking about a child welfare case versus whether we're talking about 
juvenile justice and the types of information that's going to be shared openly and freely in a child welfare or foster care context is going to be quite different than what we might hear in a juvenile justice context. So that means all kinds of family history, family ecology, uh, the experiences, diagnoses, conditions that moms, dads, and these kids have are often shared in open courtroom uh, without a lot of these folks uh, consent or understanding what that means. So really helping parents, this goes to what uh, Robin and Robert presented earlier about the importance of meaningful parent representation because I think the more we help them understand these processes and why it's happening, the more collaboration we will have with the family. And collaboration with the family is important. One of the aspects of system of care is a wraparound model that instead of having seven professionals offer seven different plans and ideas for what a child or family needs, you have the child and the family at the center of the planning process and all those seven professionals come together and they say, family, child, what do you need? And then we figure out how to you know, tailor our processes and our goals to them. Uh, oh, and one thing I like to remind people and it often gets lost in court. HIPAA is between the doctor and the patient. That's important to remember because once I get that medical information as the lawyer or as the volunteer GAL, I have no duty to not share that based on HIPAA. I might have that duty based on confidentiality, based on privilege or privacy or some policy of my organization or my work, but it is not based on HIPAA. That's an important thing to remember because Young people in particular, and I think their families, need to be informed the difference between some of these privacy and privilege uh, and confidentiality uh, distinctions because they are distinct. When I'm working with a young person as a guardian ad litem attorney, which I used to do, or as a volunteer guardian ad litem now, I make sure they know that it, what they share with me is not privileged in the way that it is privileged if they were talking to an attorney representing their express wishes or representing them directly. Now what I tell my clients, I don't know if every guardian ad litem attorney or guardian ad litem would do this, is that if I determine that the information you shared with me should not be, it is not in your best interest that that be shared in the courtroom context, that is how I will produce that same privilege outcome. Because I don't think it's in the best interest for me to tell the court right now that you have questions about your gender identity or that you might have this disability uh, or, you know, down the line. So thinking about that is something that's important to keep in mind. And talking about specific marginalized populations, it's important to remember that, uh, Rob brought this up earlier as well, uh, how maybe opinionated or loud parents or parents who have different backgrounds or experiences may be perceived as more difficult. And if that's a consistent <coughs> perception around the folks working with them, it might mean they don't get the vigorous advocacy or all the interventions they might otherwise. Well, that's true for young people, particularly young people with disabilities. Robert used the example of uh, a deaf parent. That follows down to the young person, unfortunately. Um, and they become unofficial problems and you know because they're not as easy to work with. And it's more likely that these students end up suspended or expelled. Um, or that their court hearings don't get as much of that, uh, the interview process, the deposition process, the understanding underlying needs uh, because of the disability. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of time. I have a timer right here. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've totally gone over. Uh, so I'm just going to say really quickly, uh, LGBTQ youth, um, also a uh, population of focus and we got to be concerned about family rejection is correlated highly with depression, suicidal ideation, uh, HIV risk and high risk of substance abuse. So this, these aren't things that are happening because the young people may identify as LGBTQ. It's happening as a result of external factors or results or responses they're getting as a result of how they're appearing or how they may be behaving. As a result, 26% of them report being forced to leave their home. 78% report having some contact with foster care. So we have to know that and we have to be sensitive to that if we encounter them. And one thing with lawyers particularly, uh, one of our presenters mentioned how 
Um, we, we didn't really, I didn't, I got no child welfare, no child development training before being a guardian ad litem. So if it wasn't for having one of the foremost child welfare, ch uh, uh, child development experts as a judge, I may have never known that a mother's dental hygiene affects the baby in the womb. I would have never known that crime prevention starts from age zero to three. I would have never known that if a young person is not on track by third grade, there's a 99% chance they'll end up in the juvenile justice system. It's important to know that because if I was a lawyer representing a client who had an aquatics accident on a wave runner at a resort, I would learn everything about that resort and a wave runner and a beach and a wave. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing should happen for children. I should not be able to go in front of a judge without understanding adolescent brain development, without knowing that a child's brain, an adolescent brain, is designed to take risks. So it's designed to test its environment. And without knowing that we don't have access to our executive function until our mid-20s. As a result, I don't think it's possible to ever try a child as an adult. That's just Gary Bevel, the children's ombudsperson person speaking, but since I'm in an independent office, I get to say that and not care what other people think. And the last thing I'll say is, it's also important, there's gonna be no way to address the needs of young people, mental health, identity, or otherwise, if I bring judgment or a need to be right to it. The question I ask myself is, do I wanna be right, or do I wanna have a ha happy, healthy child or client? And 100%, I want to have a happy, healthy child or client. When I was a prosecutor, that only lasted six months because I reached this point where I was prosecuting the same prostitutes over and over and over and over. And I was, one, I don't know that I agree that prostitution should be legal, separate symposium. <laughs> uh, <illegal. laughs> separate symposium. There are some power dynamics, uh, sexism issues. Yeah. But here's the point. I could not effectively be a prosecutor because I did not agree with how we were prosecuting uh, certain populations, so I quit my job. That was my responsibility. I do not get to continue a job that I'm not gonna be effective at just because I want to keep a job or because it's convenient for me. It wasn't until I got to the Guardian of Lightham program and I got to be a part of at least trying to treat the family in a more holistic environment that I felt comfortable applying some of these legal ideas and principles. So it's incumbent upon us as advocates and as lawyers and as workers to make sure we can fully do our job and if we can't, it's our responsibility to remove ourselves. Uh, with that. <laughs> I'm not a private entity, so I will not <laughs> <address>. <laughs> um, It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I know they put up the juvenile justice process. Um, I know there was some sessions earlier um, between the public defender and state attorney's office. So I'm not really gonna talk about the process other than um, every time a child is arrested, they are brought to the Juvenile Assessment Center on 8th Street and they are assessed by our wonderful staff. Uh, we service between 350 and 400 youth every month at that juvenile assessment center. Now, as far as mental health and substance abuse, each child receives an assessment at the time that they uh, come into the facility. We identify what we call as hits, we look at their criminogenic needs, their risk factors, and et cetera, um, and identify based on that child's self-report if they have a mental health or substance abuse um, issue. Based on that information, if that child is held in secure detention, we have what we call the detention risk assessment instrument that if a child scores 12 or above on that instrument, they will be securely detained in the detention center. We have three licensed mental health um, professionals at the detention center that the department contracts with a private entity um, to provide services. We also um, contract with uh, a doctor to come in and do psychological evaluations. The youth are provided with the medications, whether they come in with, those will be continued, the medications. Um, if it's something we identify while they're there in partnership with the parents. Um, they will be placed on medication. Um, 
what we've identified in the last, I'd say, year and a half, um, we do have some extreme gaps at times because if a child is arrested prior to the time that they go to disposition, we have no ability to, um, I hate to use the word force, but I'll use the word force, or ensure that they receive the treatment that they need. So there is that gap there. But we currently have a, a grant from DCF in partnership with System of Care that's located actually at the Jack, and they are doing assessments for mental health and substance abuse and doing referrals and follow-up. So we are seeing growth in all the areas. As far as other things that um, we have done in partnership with public defenders, state attorney's office courts, systems of care, um, is a girls' court. We started that, I think, about four months ago, um, where it is that open form that Gary was talking about. Um, these are not girls that are under the um, supervision of DCF. These are girls that are still in the community with their families, um, but we do the wraparound. They go into system of care or uh, other providers in order to address their mental health needs. These are girls that have either been traumatized by sexual abuse, human trafficking, um, pregnancy, in situations where they need additional um, support. And we also um, are working with the courts to identify as much as we can, because there are those rules that we have to follow about how much we provide to outside entities. Um, but to identify when they have mental health or especially substance abuse issues, um, we can refer them to drug court. We have a, a tremendous drug court in Jacksonville uh, and um, with a provider that is ca capable of doing um, treatment, we have contracts. The department itself um, has contracts for substance abuse residential. We have mental health contracts um, to provide care and um, also um, a contract for sex, sex offender treatment. Um, not all circuits in the state of Florida have that, but based on need in Jacksonville, Clay and Nassau counties, we do have that. Um, so we are trying to make an effort where it's not a punitive, like completely punitive system, but that we are actually addressing the needs of, of the children. Each child has a, um, what we call a yes plan, which is um, a roadmap for the parent, the child, and the JPO based on what the expectations are as far as the court order. But it also provides guidance as far as therapeutic care. So um, it has been a tremendous um, opportunity for myself and my staff to join with this team to try and move us to a different place um, because there is a reason that a lot of these children um, are in our system and a lot of that is based on their mental health or their family situations. Um, we're working very strongly with Duval County Public School System. Um, every child that comes out of a residential treatment program, um, we staff that child with um, SIDNET um, Duval County Public School and anyone else that's going to be involved with that child's life when they come out because a child that goes into commitment program they have about a 41 percent chance of recidivism so we are trying to see what we can do to try to bridge that gap so um, we are nowhere near where we need to be or where we want to be um, but it is great to be in Jacksonville with the, the group of individuals that, that we have here. So when we talk about mental illness, Vicki mentioned a lot of the, the diagnoses that um, we see in our kids are the result of trauma. And that is especially true most, most, mostly with our girls. Um, when you have multiple systems involvement, being child welfare, Department of Juvenile Justice, or the homeless system, that's a traumatic event. I have a five-year-old. If he was taken from my home by a child protective service worker, 
or by a police officer, even if I was abusing him, that is a bond. Even if it is in his best interest, it's still a bond. And that is a traumatic experience, having a child be removed from their primary caregiver, regardless of what's going on in the home. Um, having a child be arrested, put in the back of a police car, put in a detention center with older, bigger, stronger, scary <laughs> kids is traumatic. Being in the homeless system, not knowing where you're going to sleep at night. Our homeless kids in public schools that are homeless right now is significantly high. That's a traumatic experience and a lot of that results in mental illness for our kids. It impacts their ability to think clearly, their ability to problem solve. Remember, their brain is still forming, it's still developing. So anytime you have a traumatic experience, that affects the brain development. It affects their self-concept, um, their self-worth, their value, their behavior. Obviously, if a child is abused, God forbid, a girl or a boy sexually abused, imagine the kind of anger, the kind of um, lack of impulse control that child is going to have, um, their emotional responses and their physical health, all of that is affected by trauma. And so what we create is this cycle, right? So we have them removed from care in their best interest most of the time, but that's trauma. And so then they act out, and oftentimes, as, as Gary talked about, are arrested. And so then they're placed in the Department of Juvenile Justice System, and it's a cycle. If you ever meet Sheriff Rutherford, he's one of the greatest advocates we have in our community for mental illness. He will tell you that he runs the largest mental health treatment facility in this community because he's in charge of Duval County Jail. That is the largest mental health treatment facility in our area. And, and when we have kids that are going through these multiple systems, as we've talked about, all of that trauma oftentimes leads them right into that adult system. And, and a lot of times it's the result of untreated mental illness. So it's really important that we look at prevention, that we look at some of the interventions um, and focus on that. So as Gwen talked about, we do um, a good job of doing substance abuse and mental health evaluations. We need to do more. We need to do more in-depth um, mental health and substance abuse evaluations that comes with additional resources that are greatly needed. We'll talk about that a little bit more. We need to make sure that our kids are linked to psychiatric services and med management. Um, I, the presenter previous said, you know, not all kids need medication, and that's absolutely true, but a lot of them do. And, and that's okay. If, if you have a heart condition that requires you to take a pill every day, then you, then you take the pill every day. It's the same thing with mental illness. Um, we need to make sure that we're doing care coordination and case management. That is the biggest thing that we can do for our kids is ensuring that they are getting all of the care coordination that they need for not only themselves, but their family as well, um, whoever their caregivers are. Um, specialized treatment for sex offenders and sexual abuse. Kids who are sexually abused are significantly higher um, in their likelihood to become sex offenders. And so we've got to get them treatment early and quickly and not just <coughs> put them in, in, a, in a juvenile justice facility and, and hope for the best. We, we're doing a good job of providing the specialized treatment, but again, we need to do more. Um, we need to educate parents and empower their abilities, look at the strengths of our parents. Um, and, and we do have residential placements for youth of high risk and high need. We do have a, an issue of public safety. Um, while we are trying to care for our kids and, and do everything we can for them, we have to ensure public safety as well. And sometimes that requires residential placement. And that's not always the worst thing because a lot of times kids can get a lot of treatment in a residential facility. My very first career job was working in a level six facility. So it was a four to six month commitment for teenage boys. And the, the amount of support and the amount of help that they were given because they were away from their envi environment for six months was really good for them. It was really good for them to get away for a while and kind of take a, a different look at their life and decisions that they're making. So when we look at some of the strengths of our community, um, as I mentioned before, we have a very collaborative community, which is really, really critical. 
Um, we have a really engaged philanthropic community. Dolores Bar Weaver is a godsend for the Jacksonville community, and I can't imagine what our community would be like without her and her husband. They have donated millions and millions and millions to mental health and to the kids in this community, and it's significant. Um, we have the Jacksonville System of Care Initiative Grant, which Vicki talked about earlier, which is bringing together all of the, the key decision makers to really transform the mental health system for our children of the most vulnerable populations, as she, as she mentioned. Um, many of you might have read about the JCCI mental health inquiry in the paper. It's been covered a lot. Um, it was a 26-week study of mental illness in our community of which we've now embarked on implementation where we are looking at a lot of the issues that are facing our community with mental illness. Um, there are seven subcommittees that meet all the time <laughs> addressing mental illness in our community. Um, there's a lot of increased knowledge, professional development in regards to trauma, which is really important. We also have a collaborative team that is um, working on developing a mental health court for juveniles and having a juvenile mental health court um, significant, um, significant leap for our community. But at the same time, we have a lot of challenges. Um, we don't focus on prevention, um, which I can't say enough of. We've got to do a better job of focusing on prevention. We've got to do a better job of assessing and identifying kids who have a mental illness. If we don't assess them and we don't identify who they are, they're never going to get the treatment and the, and the care coordination that they need. Oh, yeah, just to jump in right here um, for a minute. The last presenters had talked about the, um, the young lady who was raped and did not get any treatment. Did, I don't know if anybody saw the front page of today's paper that talked about the Columbia teen who um, killed her, murdered her brother. Um, and in Columbia County, she actually was sentenced to probation. So, um, but one of the things which I think was a very um, bold uh, decision by the state attorney, uh, I'm not so sure that would have been the case had she had, she, had that happened here. But one of the things the state attorney's office and, and that came out in this um, article was just about the years of unaddressed sexual abuse that this child had experienced. And so when we talk about um, trauma, and especially untreated trauma, uh, manifesting itself into behaviors that well, sometimes the very first time they get noticed is when they come before the juvenile justice system or the delinquency system. And I think that's really important um, as uh, defense uh, individuals to, to recognize that this is, you know, when, when you have these types of traumas that end up putting children in with their trauma, their lack of brain development, um, you have a perfect storm for behaviors, and a lot of times, these are the same kids, the kids that have mental health issues, um, the kids in the juvenile justice system. It, sometimes it just depends on which system captures them first. If they get identified early on at five or six years old, they may very well stay in the mental health system because when they're um, doing some vandalism, we attribute it to their mental health. However, if they are captured in the juvenile justice system first, that's where they're going to likely remain. They will just get diagnosed later on with that, so. Because that's such an important point. Has, has anyone ever tried an emotional abuse case? That is so interesting. You have, Joey. Like, it's so rare, though. Yeah. And, but, and to me, the Columbia case is a perfect example of a young lady who was probably emotionally abused, um, but because that, and, and probably this prosecutor is appreciating and, and reviewing this case, like what that meant. But this is another one of the challenges when we're talking about mental health and these settings, because if we haven't appreciated what the young person might have been experiencing in terms of uh, mental and psychological harm, and if that is not the source of our advocacy and our legal advocacy, so often that gets left behind. And again, then when we're talking about some of the marginalized populations, like do we understand that girls experience depression differently than boys? So boys might be a little bit more prone to act out, girls a little bit more withdrawn, they internalize the behavior, make it a reflection of themselves, so it's more likely to reduce their, or, or affect their self-esteem in different ways. But if we're not appreciating and talking about these differences, but then reacting to the behaviors, we're not putting ourselves in a position to make sure that these young people don't, uh, aren't re-traumatized, uh, uh, or aren't recidivists. 
Um, it, we have to be thinking differently about you know what our advocacy looks like and, and, and pushing for some of the things that are against the status quo. That's why I asked the question about emotional abuse. I don't think in my three years as a guardian letter attorney, ever, anyone ever prosecuted that or addressed that. Thank you. That goes right into the, to the last slide. Um, so I've been in Tallahassee a lot and we're fighting a good fight for mental illness and, and just to kind of give you um, a snapshot of what we're working on. Um, Real quickly, we haven't seen an increase in mental health funding in over two decades. And so right now, Medicaid only reimburses 60% of the actual cost of services. So we are we're really struggling um, in, in, in our community. And, and when you see increased criminal justice, increased homelessness, increased domestic violence, increased poverty, it, a lot of that comes from untreated mental illness. We just don't provide funding to really treat are mentally ill and the funding that we do provide, we provide in the deep end, very costly services in the crisis stabilization units in the jails and the prisons. And so we're really trying to get increased funding this year. The Healthy Florida Works program is um, a version of Medicaid expansion that we're really fighting um, for in Tallahassee. It would draw down billions of dollars from the federal government and cover 800,000 additional Floridians um, in the Medicaid system. And, and keep in mind, the better we get at screening and identifying, the more people that are going to need treatment. Um, there, there was just filed by Representative Peters the Behavioral Health Transformation Bill, which includes data collection. There is, we do a terrible, in this day and age with technology, you would be shocked at the data that's collected and when it's reported and when it's shared. Um, which is a significant barrier to treatment. Um, there's also a workforce development um, component of that. Right now, Florida is the only state who does not allow advanced registered nurse practitioners to prescribe all classes of medications. We have an extreme shortage of psychiatrists um, in our community, also because we don't pay them <laughs> what they can make in other states. Yeah. Um, and so there's a piece of legislation in both sides, the Senate and the House, that would allow um, Florida to finally um, get up in, in par with all other states and allow advanced registered nurse practitioners to prescribe all classes of medication, which would help with capacity. They're looking at codifying mental health court um, throughout the state, which would be a really important deal. And they're looking at crisis intervention team training for all police officers, not only at orientation, but on an ongoing basis. So those are some of the pieces of legislation related to mental health that um, are going on in our state right now. There are several others. Session just started this week, so um, it's a pretty exciting time. And I can tell you that next year, session starts January 1 or January 2. Um, and so it starts two months earlier, so we've got to get to work two months faster. So, um, so there's a lot going on with mental illness. And with that, we have about eight minutes for questions. So. Any questions? You want one what old man's opinion? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're too young to give it, but we'll take it. Mental health is a problem in 100% of our youth. Some of them can cope with it without outside intervention, and those are the ones that we're thinking about. The analogy that I bring is every square foot of landscape in Florida has termites. Your job is to keep it out of the house. Everybody in this room, I don't need the microphone. <laughs> Everybody in this room has cancer. It just hasn't come to the surface in some of you. One out of three, I believe that's the figure, one out of three will be treated for it because it comes to the surface. The other two are going to die before it kills you. Mental health is in all of our children. Some of them cope with it. Some of them get help before it becomes a problem. Very well said. <laughs> Did somebody record that? <laughs> yes. I'd like to take that to the next one. Yeah. Uh, 
I have a, I have a suggestive comment for Gary. I really think that you should write a, an experiential uh, book expressing your experiential views based on what you have stated before this body here today could be of great value to a large segment of children and other people. So uh, even at your age, you have a lot of relevant <laughs> information to share, but I think that could uh, really be of great use. That's very kind of feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, we got you up five minutes early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you guys.